Hi everyone, today I wanna to continue the exploration into pattern synonyms. Um, and so last week I did a little introduction of them. Today I wanna to talk all about types of pattern synonyms because it turns out that the type of a pattern synonym has six distinct parts. And it's quite confusing and they can have two contexts and two for alls and there's a lot going on there. So we're, we're gonna sort of explore all of that. Um, so I wanna start out with something really simple. Right. If we if we make a simple pattern, it's going to have a simple type. So I can I can say let's get rid of this problem. So that's going to be distracting. Um, uh, Trueish, and then just say that that equals true. And you know that has type bool. That's not really a surprise. So that part is good. This is, we have simple things are simple. Um, I can also have some a pattern uh, justish a equals just a. And that's going to have this type, but but already something is a little bit interesting here in that this is the type of just, but here it's a pattern, so it's a little bit different. There's something else slightly going on, which is that this part here that's the type of the function that we're going to be matching against. So if I write some function here, and uh, no, I don't want to type signature yet. I want to say justish x equals I don't know x. Um, then here, the type of the argument is going to be just this piece of the type. So somehow the arrow here is important. It's plucking out just this result. And then this thing after the word justish, whoops, um, is going to is going to have this type here. So we get this type when I just do a pattern match. Um, so, so already we're, we're sort of decomposing this type a little bit. Um, I could also do something like this. Am I allowed to do this? I don't know. That looks suspicious. No, it doesn't like that. Uh, conflicting definitions for A. Mm, we could do something very clever to make that work, but we'll return to that maybe in a little bit or maybe not. Um, okay, so so here we, we already see some interesting things, but uh, I want to look at some slightly more interesting patterns that we could write. So if I write this... I'm going to write something that doesn't actually parse so that so that uh, VS Code doesn't fill it in for me, or HLS, I should really say. So what type is this function going to have? Let's say I write true over here. So it's going to return a bool. Um, well, we could think that it's going to, well, it has to take, you know, we could think, oh, it takes int to bool. But actually, it's going to be more general than that, because 3 could have any numeric type. So we could say it's a to bool, as long as a is, is in the num class. Turns out that we need more than just num. We also need eek. Um, and so we need all of that stuff. So if I put in true here, that type checks, although we get, oh, because the patterns are non exhaustive. Um, and if I comment this out, then indeed we get the same type back. So this is really the most general type for us. But I want to think a little bit about where these constraints come from. So these constraints come from the pattern. Normally constraints come from things on the right hand side because I've used a number over here or I've used an equal sign. All these things are going to create constraints in my type. But here it's a little weird. It's coming from the pattern. So if I make a pattern three, then we need these constraints in the pattern type. Um, and so what this pattern type is saying is that if I want to use this pattern three, then I can only do it against a type that's both eek and num. So I can write int arrow bool, and I can match against three equals false here, for example. This is also going to be an incomplete pattern match, um, but it type checks. It's only a, a, a yellow squiggle, it's not a red one. Um, but let's see, I couldn't, let's say, put bool here. Now I'm going to get an error. Um, I don't care about pattern matches or non-exhaustive. Can, uh, oh, here, no inst oh, my. No instance for num bool arising from a pattern. That's the, that's the error I expect. And we can see that in the type of this three pattern synonym because it requires that we have eek a and num a. Okay. Um, so we can get things, things in Haskell though, of course, get a little bit more complicated. Um, so I could make a GADT. Um, so if I write data T A where muck T is eek A num A T A. Um, let's see. 
So this is probably going to complain about missing extensions. So can I quick fix and get it? Yes, please do that. Okay. So uh, this works, this MUCT works. And what this essentially allows me to do is to pack information about this A. So in this case, it's not, it's not really a very useful scenario. But let me, make the, let me make this slightly more useful by not having the A at all. So let's get rid of the A and instead just have an argument of type A. So how is this useful? So this is like a slight digression into existential types, but we need existential types to be able to write interesting patterns that demonstrate all of the interesting pattern synonym, pattern synonym types that we might want to write. So here I can now have a function h takes t um, and uh, let's say goes to bool. And I can say h of mct of x checks whether x equals 3. And this type checks. What's going on here is that this t, each t, rather the mukt constructor, stores some a value of some type a. I don't know what type it's going to be, but I do know it's going to have an eek type class and a num type class. If I got rid of one of these constraints and I just say eek a, then down here could not deduce num a arising from the literal three. And and that's because I really don't know that whatever this type A is, I don't know that it's going to be a num, right? And note, there's no constraint I can put up here, right? It's sort of tempting to write something like num A up here, but that doesn't work because the A type variable isn't in scope yet. Um, so really, it only we can only sort of put it here. And in fact, I think GHC suggests possible fix, add num a to the context of the data constructor. It knows what it's talking about here. So it knows that I need to do this. Um, okay, so now let's try to take this mct pattern and turn it into a pattern synonym. Um, so we'll call this mct-ish. Um, and this, I'm going to say mct-ish of x is muk t of x. Now we get a very bizarre type. And it's the correct type here. So let's let's walk through this a moment. Um, the idea here is that this muk t ish is quite different than my pattern 3. And that's because 3 requires from outside that eek a and num a hold. On the other hand, muk t ish makes no requirements on the outside world. Instead, it's saying that when we pattern match, we're going to learn that eek a and num a hold. Um, and so that means that a pattern synonym actually has two separate constraints. We call this first constraint the required constraint. The second one is called the provided constraint. I'm going to write that out. So this is required. And whoops, and this one is provided. The idea here is that this the required constraint must be true before we ever look at anything. The, the pattern match itself doesn't say anything about this other than it uses this information. That's true for three. Eek a and num a must be true in order to write three here, which is why there's a small error there. Let's get rid of that error, turn it, turn it back into int. Um, on the other hand, a provided constraint is something that we learn by doing the pattern match. And so that means that in the right-hand side of a function using mctish, here, uh, well, we're going to get incomplete pattern match, even though it's complete. Let me add the complete pragma. So complete mctish. Um, so here we learn that this A type here is actually eek and num. Now, something that interesting that we could do is instead of having this be some, some hidden type here, I can actually put it out here. And I can say TA. And now this is TA. Um, and this has to be TA. OK, so I've changed everything now to have this A parameter. So what has that really done? So, so far, everything looks the same. Well, let's go back to, to this example here. This is now a little bit odd in that here I'm comparing x against 3, but there's no constraints. I don't have eek a or num a up here. That's because I learned these facts by the pattern match. We can see this by if I comment out this pattern match and instead 
Um, uh, but, 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 what, what do I want to say here? Oh, phooey. This is going to be sort of hard to wrangle, isn't it? Let me take, maybe change this to look like this. And then now I can say this and underscore. Let's do that. Okay, so now here, no instance for eek a because I'm trying to, to compare it against something. That's not really a surprise. I haven't said that there is. If, on the other hand, I write mctish, even if I don't actually match on any variable here, now this is accepted. And that's because my mctish pattern has provided the information about eek a and num a so that this right-hand side suddenly makes sense. So that's why it's sometimes useful to have provided things. They really only come up in the context of GADTs, though. Um, OK, so I've said that there were six parts to a pattern type signature. We can start to explore four of them already. So one is this required constraint. So this McTeeish has no required constraint, but it does have a provided one. Um, we can make something more elaborate that has both. Uh, but up here, we use a provided constraint. By the way, if I wanted to, I could make it explicit. Whoops. That there's no provide that there's no provided constraint right this is still accepted even though this looks quite weird but pattern synonym signatures really do have these two contexts um, then we have the arguments to the pattern which are all the parts that don't include this final part and then there's the final part which is the sort of the type of the of the pattern so this mctish is going to match against ta whereas this a here is really saying what the type of that part is. Um, just to have yet another example, let's have something with multiple fields in it. Um, so now let's actually, let's go back and do the more complicated one that we tried before. I'm going to call this twice. Um, so twice is going to have x and y. And it's just going to match against one thing. Um, but what do I want to do? I want to write something that looks like this. It has to be quite complicated. Um, I will walk through it once I have enough parentheses. And now hopefully it complains about view patterns. Yes, it does. X, oh, no code. I actually have to go here maybe. View patterns. OK. Um, OK, so this works. What's going on here? So what's going on here is I'm using a view pattern. You might remember from last time that a view pattern is a function that's applied to the thing that you're matching against, and then the actual pattern match goes to the right of this arrow. So I'm taking the thing that we're matching against, and I'm duplicating it in a tuple, and then matching against the two different parts of the tuple. So here I've made a pattern where I can actually bind the same thing twice if I wanted to do that. And sure enough, we're going to get a pattern synonym signature that has two things before the final arrow. Um, this final arrow is, is, a, is, is a plain old B here because um, that's the type of this Z. If I change this to just Z, then we're going to get an error. Let's just comment this out, and it'll infer a new one, and then it'll be maybe B, right? because now we're matching against a maybe right here. Uh, but there's still two different arguments to the pattern, this x and y, corresponding to these two arguments here. So this last thing is really different in a pattern synonym type than these others. Um, OK, let's go back. Let's go and, and look at the last two pieces of a pattern synonym type signature. And that those are the universal variables and the existential variables. So I want to go back to this, this mct for a sec, and let's remove this a parameter. I have to remove it everywhere. Um, oh, now there's no connection between this and that. So let's go back to the way things were. That should work now, I hope, maybe? No. Why not? Why is this not working? I want this to work. Couldn't match expected type. Oh, haha, -ha, I haven't fixed my type. There we go. OK. Um, so here, uh, let's look at, let's start by looking at um, McT. So McT talks about a variable A, but that variable isn't mentioned in the result T. And what that means is that when I pattern match on McT, I'm going to get a, um, an argument, he, here it's X, of some unknown type A. We call that A existentially bound. And that's because we know that there's some type 
that exists for a, but we don't know what it is. When we have x here, I don't know is x of type int, is x of type integer, is x of type double. There's no way to know because that information hasn't been stored. And so whatever I write over here has to work for some abstract type a as long as that a is in the eek class and the num class. This is an existential type variable. If in a pattern synonym signature, I wish to explicitly quantify over an existential type variable, I have to do so after the first context. So let me be very specific here, and I'll show you the error that comes up. If I write for all a here, I'm going to get an error, but this is going to be the silly error. Uh, let's turn on, sure, rank n types. Um, so here, oh. Could not deduce eek a arising from the prov. Oh dear. Um, in other words, a successful match on the pattern mctx does not provide the constraint eek a. That's because GHC is a little confused with this type signature. What my a really means, um, and that's because I've quantified it in the wrong place. If I write for all a here, hopefully yes, everything is hunky dory, um, and that's because in a pattern synonym type signature. Um, we have the universals are up here. So if I go back to my three, I can write for all a here, and that is happy. But for my muktiish, it has to be after the first context. Um, and, and that's because this a is existentially bound. When I match on mkt, I'm learning what a is. That's one of these existential variables, and it must be quantified here so that GHC knows in the type, in the type of McTeeish, that it's one of these existential ones. When I tried writing it up here, GHC was expecting it not to be existential. It was expecting it to be universal. Universal variables are like required. They come in from outside. So here, if we look at my pattern three, then the outside um, uh, value against which I am matching that has type A. So that's what I mean by it comes in from outside. My pattern isn't producing any information about this. On the other hand, with Muktiish, I don't know what A is. A can't come from outside. All I have is a type T. There's no TA here. And so that means that my pattern must itself produce the A. That's kind of like these provided constraints, and we call that an existential type variable. Um, it's a bit of a journey to talk about how we get from universal existential quantification that you might learn in, in a, I don't know, a discrete mathematics course to my use of existential and universal here. But there is a connection. I don't want to explore that quite right now. What I do want to say is that when you quantify a variable after this first fat arrow, that means it's existential. If you quantify a variable before the first fat arrow, it's universal. Universals come from outside. Existentials essentially come from within. So now we really have our six parts. We have our universal variables, which here we have none of. Then we have our required constraints. Here it's trivial. Then we have our existential variables. Then we have our provided constraints. Then our arguments, and then finally our result. So these pattern synonym types are a little bit confusing. Um, I've wondered if instead of our current syntax, we should have something that looks like this. Whoops, universals. No universals. Um, required is empty. This would be existentials. And we have provided. And then we have arguments. Oops, this is still a list. And oh, what's going on here? Somehow I've lost my T. Um, so would this be better? I don't know. This is very verbose. But it's also really easy to search for. It's really easy to read. And it makes it clear that a pattern synonym type is not an ordinary type. So sometimes I think this is better. It's not what we have in GHC today, and we have this sort of funny syntax with multiple constraints on it. Um, anyway, I hope this has been interesting. Thanks very much for watching. More about pattern synonyms in future weeks. Bye.